When AMD released its original iteration of Ryzen, it really did change everything. Again. Let me explain. During the era of the Pentium 4, AMD was absolutely killing it. If you wanted the best CPU for the money, you bought AMD. Hell, if you wanted the best CPU period, you bought AMD. At the time, Athlon XP was king. Intel chips ran hotter and cost more. Sure, the net burst architecture Pentium 4s had fancy things like 3 plus gigahertz clock speeds, 800 megahertz front side buses, hyper threading, and a multi billion dollar marketing budget. What they didn't have, however, was performance. For those of you that don't remember or simply never knew of the naming schemes in consumer CPUs back then, it was like this. The two CPU companies, Intel and AMD, would have one high-end CPU and one low-end CPU. For AMD, this was the Athlon and Duron, respectively. For Intel, this was the Pentium and the Celeron. In this article, we are going to just focus on the high-end chips because for all practical purposes, the low-end chips were just imperfect versions of the high-end chips that either had certain components like cache disabled or clock speeds lowered, so they were stable enough to sell as lower-end chips. A Pentium 4 that ran at 2.8 GHz was just called a 2.8 GHz Pentium 4. There was none of the wacky consumer CPU naming rubbish that we have today. There was no Pentium 4 2800S, for example. It was just a 2.8 GHz Pentium 4. Funny thing is that 2.8 GHz Pentium 4 was outperformed by 2.0 GHz Athlon XP. But people were really confused by this. How could it be that a faster processor was, well, slower? Athlon XP showed that it's not all about clock speeds. A CPU with a lower clock speed can be faster than one with a higher clock speed in the same way that a smaller car engine can have more output power than a larger one. A better design. AMD could have spent millions of dollars trying to educate the public on this. They could have explained that it's not so much about how many cycles per second, that's gigahertz, your CPU can do, and it's more about how much work your CPU does in each clock cycle. They didn't go this route though, and they instead decided to introduce a new way to name and market CPUs. This is why when you bought an Athlon XP, it was sold as an Athlon XP 2800 plus, or something along those lines, depending on which one you bought. That was AMD's way of saying, this CPU will perform just as well or better than a 2.8 GHz Pentium 4. And they really, really did. At the time, there was no reason at all to buy Intel. Then, as if things could not get any better, AMD released the Athlon 64. It was the first consumer 64-bit CPU, but more importantly, they moved the memory controller to the CPU and employed a host of additional architectural improvements that gave consumers even less of a reason to buy an Intel chip. But then Intel introduced the Core 2 Duo, and then everything changed. In 2006, at the very moment that Intel released the Core 2 Duo, Intel turned the tide once more and became the only company to consider when purchasing a CPU. With their new architecture, there was now no reason to buy AMD. Now Intel chips were the ones that were faster, yet with lower clock speeds. Now Intel CPUs were the ones that produced less heat, yet gave you more FPS, that's frames per second, in your favorite PC games. Once Intel took back the performance crown, AMD didn't stand a chance. They released chip after chip, socket after socket, architecture after architecture, disappointment after disappointment, until Ryzen. It took them 11 years, but they finally got their CPU design team together and made a great CPU. Ryzen was hyped up to be the game changer that AMD's fans and stockholders were waiting for, and it was. 
It showed once again that AMD had great engineers. It showed the world and long awaiting AMD fans that AMD could make a great CPU that could once again outperform Intel's offerings across the board. Now AMD has released the next iteration of its Ryzen architecture and thankfully for AMD and all of its loyal fans, it did not disappoint. The AMD Ryzen 3900X outperforms the Intel Core i9 in every way while producing less heat, using less power, and costing far less than Intel's Core i9 flagship offering. Intel is completely ashamed of this fact. In fact, it refused to send Linus Tech Tips a sample CPU to compare against AMD's new chip out of total embarrassment. Welcome back to Tech Daily. We have Joe with us again. How you doing, Joe? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Matt? Fantastic. Good to hear um, it. You've got this new article on the Ryzen 9, is that correct? Absolutely. Now, is it called the Ryzen 9 or is it the Ryzen 3900 or how does this naming scheme work? Okay, so the naming schemes of CPUs have changed drastically over the last 10 years or so. Uh, AMD really started it uh, with the Qantas Speed architecture introduced in the Athlon XP. Um, they realized that people don't really understand the inner workings of a CPU, and when they're selling a like a 1.4 gigahertz CPU, no one's gonna buy that if Intel's got a, a two gigahertz CPU at the same price. So uh, as I mentioned in the article, they came up with this product rating. It, it was the first time that I'm aware of that a CPU wasn't just marketed as a certain model with a certain speed. So they introduced this, you know, uh, 2800 plus or 1700 plus naming scheme. Uh, and that was actually really successful for AMD, and it kind of changed the way that CPUs were named. So because of this, now uh, when Intel released the Core 2 Duo, they took a they took a play from AMD's book, which they often do. Uh, you know, hashtag dual core, hashtag 64 bit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so 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 they took a play from AMD's book, and they 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 used a new way of naming CPUs. They came out with. Uh, the core i3, i5, and i7, well, in the reverse order. So they came out with the i7, i5, and i3 to, to help customers understand what CPU is better because there's so many things about a CPU now, uh, how much cache it has, how many PCI Express lanes it has, the clock speed, of course, how many cores it has, whether or not it has SMT, which is symmetric multi-threading. Uh, AMD calls it... Uh, I'm not actually. I forget what AMD calls it. <laughs> Intel calls it hyperthreading, though. I don't think AMD calls it anything. Actually, I think they just do it. Uh, but anyways, there's different features that CPUs have or don't have. So uh, now, now they're not just coming up with these names to differentiate their product from competition. Now they have to have these complex naming schemes just to differentiate their own products. So. Uh, Intel came out with the, the, the i5, 3, and 7, okay? Sorry, let me say that again. So Intel came out with their way of naming things, and, and AMD has piggybacked onto that. When they released their Ryzen chips, uh, they released the Ryzen 7, Ryzen 5, and Ryzen 3. But, you know, so people can compare them to Intel CPUs with ease, okay? Um, but now... Uh, they're at it again. Intel released the i9 CPU, so Ryzen's come up with a Ryzen 9 CPU. But let's all let's remember that these names are just to help people understand the difference in performance of CPUs. The names really don't mean anything. They're they're arbitrary. In fact, uh, a lot of the time, if you look at the spec sheet of like let's say a, an Intel Core i7 chip versus an Intel Core i5 chip you'll see that they are the same exact CPU based on the same architecture. They can even have the same clock speeds with just one thing disabled, like hyper-threading, or maybe they still have hyper-threading, but it's 200 megahertz slower or four megabytes less cache, so they, they call it a different chip. 
So this new chip is the Ryzen 9. It's just AMD's latest chip. Uh, the, the next wave of Ryzen 7s and Ryzen 5s and Ryzen 3s will be based on this Ryzen 9. I understand this is an AM4 socket, right? Yes. So, but that's not going to work on any AM4 motherboard, right? Okay, so it looks like these CPUs will work in just about any uh, socket AM4 board. Uh, I found a website that confirms that it'll work with the X570 chipset, the X470 chipset, and the B450. Now, the B350 chipset, which is the one right before, or just the right under, the B450, it's not m mentioned, uh, but it's not specifically excluded either. It'll probably work in any board that has a BIOS update. So I think this is only going to not work in boards that, uh, like, uh, really, really low-end boards where the manufacturers don't push out updated BIOSes. So basically, this will work in any board, any, any socket AM4 board. Well, that's that's good news then. That is very good news. <clears throat> uh, this isn't the first Ryzen chip. No, no, it's the third series. Uh, that's why it's a, the Ryzen three thousand. But I believe it's actually the second generation. Um, the Ryzen two thousand series, which is the one you have, is like the the second iteration of it it's like a refresh if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. i believe this is the first actual generational uptick of ryzen i see so so it would actually be a pretty significant upgrade absolutely dramatic yeah um in every way like the processors are more power efficient uh they're more um clock efficient like they get more work done per clock cycle than the ones before it, which you would expect in a CPU. But the gains are pretty huge, and in addition to um, in addition to having better performance per core, they've just got so many cores. So this thing's got more cores than you've got fingers, and it's got more <laughs> threads than you've got fingers and toes. <laughs> that's that's pretty impressive. Now, the I think the one of the biggest questions is how does it compare to Intel chips? Because Intel has been, been really leading the game for a while. Yeah, 11 years until last year. Uh, it, just it just destroys the Core i9 series. Just destroys it. And the Core i9 is the Intel's latest, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, Intel's got like $75 billion or something. They're much. They're a much larger company than AMD, uh, but they don't. There's one thing that they do not have. Well, what's that? Jim Keller. <laughs> uh, what's so great about Jim Keller? Who is he, and what does he do? Well, um, what's so great about Jim Keller is that he is an excellent CPU designer. Uh, he worked at AMD during the time that the Athlon XP was designed. Now, he's got a habit. This guy has a habit of working for a company for a year or two and then leaving. And then, like, he'll, he'll work for a company for a year or two and then just do absolutely great work. And before it's released, before the fruits of his labor are released, he'll leave the company because he know he's so confident that he's just done, that he's just done a great job that he'll leave. And sure enough, the he's right. Okay, so this is what happened. He worked for AMD for a few years and then left. Okay. And then the Athlon XP did really, really well. It it I mean it was just so amazing. Uh it was that was during the era when I built my first computer. My first computer was an Athlon XP my first computer that I built was an Athlon XP seventeen hundred plus which what I think was 1.4 gigahertz, something like that. I had 256 <laughs> megabytes of DDR1 Man. memory and an 80 gig hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> and man, was that thing fast. <laughs> it, it, I had Windows XP. It booted faster. It booted so fast. I could reinstall Windows faster than you could reboot a Pentium 4. <laughs> 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 it, it was so fast. I loved it. I loved it. And 
So anyway, Jim Keller does great with CPU design. He worked for AMD for a few years, and then the Athlon XP came out. Uh, he left AMD. Uh, I believe he also worked on the Athlon 64. I'm sorry. And, and then he left, okay? Uh, he left AMD to go work for a small company you may have heard of, uh, named after a fruit <laughs> called right, Apple. Right, right. Yeah. And, and he designed the award-winning uh, uh, processors that went into a couple uh, – couple earlier iPhones. Uh, he did really, really well with those CPUs, and those are a completely different architecture. He did great with x86, and then he did great with ARM. Uh, amazing work the guy did. Uh, so then, uh, this is during, now this is during, you know, the iPhone's out, uh, the smartphone and tablet revolution is upon us, and uh, uh, AMD's doing terrible. And uh, I, I think it was 2013 or something like that. Uh, we were at the computer shop, and I was telling you, Matt, Matt, Matt. I was telling you, this guy, Jim Keller. This is what I learned. This is what I learned about Jim Keller. I didn't know about Jim Keller until this point in the story. Uh, and then I, I was saying, hey, the, the same guy that designed the Athlon XP and Athlon 64 mm -hmm. and those nifty processors in those iPhones – uh, is is working at AMD again, and I bet I bet it's gonna change everything. And then, you know, a couple. It wasn't very interesting at the time. I, it was like a hunch of mine. Okay, at the time I, I wasn't a hundred percent sure, but I, I just really felt like it was gonna change everything. And then, boom, Ryzen came out, and it was just so great. So this guy is extremely talented, and I think I think actually he's working for Intel right now. Let me see. <laughs> He's like a freelance hardware genius who holds no corporate alliance. <laughs> Intel Intel hired Jim Keller in in April of 2018, so you can expect a comeback from Intel because because uh, they got a lot of money and they have Jim Keller. I'm now. Now, you'll find out when when Jim Keller quits, when Jim Keller quits Intel, that's when you know about a year later that their new CPU is going to be great. Now, what I hope happens is he just does a terrible job <laughs> because I really love AMD. <laughs> <laughs> I just – I that's, just I, That's interesting. Yes. Jim Keller's a genius. He's personally responsible for AMD's success, personally. I think that kind of answers my next question, which was why the sudden leap ahead of Intel. But I guess that I that's guess why it was him, huh? Yeah, that, it that, was him. It was him personally. Okay, it wasn't him and his team. Okay, it was him personally. What a his guy. team are worker bees. Yeah, yeah. He is he is really great at what he does, and he's just a nice guy. I mean, you should really look up interviews with him. He's a brilliant. Man, he's an excellent speaker. He's just a fantastic engineer. That's that's pretty cool. I'm gonna have to look into him. Yeah. Um, is this now? I remember, you know, growing up. I remember the AMD, the Athlon XP, Athlon 64. I remember that, and uh, I was always looking for the next, the next one. You know, the next one because I was, you know, that's what we did. We built computers and that could run the games we wanted to play, you know? So right. is this is this Ryzen 9 the kind of CPU that gamers will want to flock to? Yeah, absolutely. It's the only CPU gamers want to flock to, unless they just like wasting money. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it blows the competition out of the water. It, it is so amazing. You know, think about this. They put 12 cores on a $500 CPU. Okay, and and let me explain the difference between a core and a thread. Okay, so back in the single core days, you could still miraculously do more than one thing at a time. Okay, you have one CPU. Okay, but you can still run Windows and the dozens of services that have to be running to run Windows. And while you can magically listen to music and play a game at the same time yet you only have one CPU core. This is due to the magic of scheduling. Uh, an operating system is responsible for how the software interacts with the hardware. And basically, 
I'm oversimplifying it here, but let's say you have 10 tasks. Uh, the CPU will do a little bit of each one of those tasks, basically in round robin fashion, so just in order, and do that in a loop. Now, like I said, I'm oversimplifying it, but that's basically how it worked. And things got to a point to where that wasn't enough. Uh, we, we have a hard time getting past the three or four or now almost five gigahertz clock speeds. And, you know, we've achieved increased CPU performance through something called parallelism. Uh, that's by increasing the number of cores or CPUs uh, on a single chip. Now, there's an even more efficient way to do that. So Let's say you've got a assembly line, okay, uh, a conveyor belt, and there's products moving down that conveyor belt, and you have one worker working on that conveyor belt. Uh, Hyper-threading or SMT is, or, or, or like a fake dual core, as uninformed people call it, okay, uh, is basically one factory but two workers. Okay, so you have one stream of information, uh, one, 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 the same set of data, but you've got two execution cores. Okay, so when it comes to your processor, you'll have one algorithmic unit, which does all the math. You'll have one floating point processor, which assists with that. You'll have one of each other computational component, but you'll have two execution components. That, that's hyper-threading, okay? That's why... That's why when you buy a modern 8-core processor, it's got 16 threads. So the operating system sees it as a 16-core when it's really just an 8-core. This is not falsifying anything, but at the same time, it's not going to give you double the performance because you don't have double the factories. You just have double the workers. So it increases efficiency, though, in some workloads by 50 to 70 percent. And in other workloads, it decreases efficiency. But that process that but that problem has been all but eliminated. Nowadays, you get gains ranging from a few percent to 50 to 60 percent with hyperthreading. So in this new CPU, it's got 12 cores, but it's got 24 threads. When you open up Task Manager in Windows 10, it's going to show 24 CPU cores. That's 24 threads for $500. That's about $21 a thread or $40 per CPU. Back when I built my first computer, the Athlon XP 1700 Plus cost like $200. And it was a single core. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. It, is, it really is. It sounds like this chip is like really uh, raising the bar. It's rising the bar. It really is. It's, ra <laughs> it's rising <laughs> the bar. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> it really is. And uh, Intel is going to have to struggle to keep up. Now, uh, uh, so Intel may have Jim Keller's CPU design chops for now, and that's going to give them a little bit of an edge. But what Jim Keller cannot provide is manufacturing. Uh, Intel used to be the leader, but they have struggled to do 10 and 7 nanometer chips where AMD is doing it just fine. You know why AMD, a smaller company, is able to do better manufacturing than Intel? Uh, no, why? Because they spun off their fabrication business a long time ago. They don't, they're a fabulous CPU company now. All they do is design chips. They're like ARM. They don't make chips anymore. They only design them. So not only does that reduce a lot of uh, overhead, and it, and it makes it to where they can focus on just designing a CPU, uh, but it, it makes it so bigger, much larger companies can take care of that. Larger companies like the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, or TSMC, which have a fantastic manufacturing process because they make processors for more than just AMD. They have huge contracts with large vendors, and they have a lot of money. And simply put, their facilities are superior to Intel's. And Jim Keller can't give them that. Wow. Well, I'm, uh, I'm actually pretty curious to see what Jim Keller is going to crank out for Intel now. Uh, maybe he already has. I, I haven't, I mean, I found out that he's working, be, okay, so he's working for Intel uh, 
as of February 2018. His pattern, his pattern is one to two years, and then he leaves. So we're we're either just now seeing the fruits of his labor, or we're just about to. That'll be for a later article. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, can't wait You're to welcome. talk to you next time. Okay, that's gonna be in like ten minutes. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you have a good one. You too. All right, that was Joseph Everett on video call. He is a journalist and tech expert, writing for TechAndGeek.com. This podcast is brought to you by One Chair Room Productions, a media company at OneChairRoom.com. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. This has been Tech Daily. I am Matthew, TTFN.